Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes? OK. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Christina Graff. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Health and Wellbeing within the Woodrow Wilson School. And it is my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's final panel. Um, in terms of representing the Center for Health and Wellbeing, it's, uh, this is an issue of great importance to us given how often we see manifestations of environmental justice issues within the public health sphere. So given that, I'm going to introduce our two panelists. The first is Wilma Subra, committed to protecting the environment and the health and safety of citizens. Wilma Subra started Subra Company in 1981. Subra Company is a chemistry lab and environmental consulting firm in New Iberia, Louisiana. Mrs. Subra provides technical assistance to citizens across the United States and in some foreign countries concerned with their environment by combining technical research and evaluation. This information is then presented to community members so that strategies may be developed to address their local struggles. Utilizing the information gained from community involvement, the needs identified are translated into policy changes at the state and federal level through service on multi-stakeholder committees. She has just completed a seven-year term as Vice Chair of the Environmental Protection Agency National Advisory Council for Environmental Policy and Technology a five-year term on the National Advisory Committee of the U.S. Representative to the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, and a six-year term on the EPA National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, where she served as a member of a Cumulative Risk and Impacts Working Group and chaired the Gulf Coast Hurricanes Work Group. Mrs. Subra holds degrees in microbiology and chemistry from the University of Southwestern Louisiana. She received the MacArthur Fellowship Genius Award from the MacArthur Foundation for helping ordinary citizens understand, cope with, and combat environmental issues in their community, and was one of three finalists in the environmental category of the 2004 Volvo for Life Award. Our second panelist is Giovanna, Giovanna De Quiro. Giovanna De Quiro teaches in the Environmental Studies Department at Mount Holyoke College and is the co-director of the Pioneer Valley Community Environmental Justice Coalition in Western Massachusetts. Her work lies at the intersection of the fields of environmental justice, human geography, and political ecology. Her research examines the production and mobilization of uncommon environmental expertise by community activists from around the world. Who's whose community-based science blends scientific methods with locally generated environmental knowledge to address the environmental and health problems facing their communities. She has published widely in the areas of social activism and environmental justice, and is an editor of the volume Appropriating Technology, Vernacular Science and Social Power, which consists of a series of case studies of marginalized communities' use and appropriation of a range of technologies in their social and environmental change efforts. Dequiro's recent work, Tierra de Esperanza, Urban Ecologies of Latino New England, grows out of her ongoing collaborative exchanges with scholars and environmental justice activists in Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican diasporic communities in Western Massachusetts. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to address this group. This has been a wonderful experience with all the presentations all day. You heard a lot about the hurricane, the hurricane named Katrina. There were two hurricanes. Hurricane Katrina hit late August 2005 and impacted with storm surge from the western coast of Mobile Bay in Alabama, through Mississippi, and through Louisiana to New Iberia. Less than a month later, on September the 24th, Hurricane Rita surged into the Gulf and again impacted from the western shore of Mobile Bay through Mississippi and through Louisiana and the edge of Texas. And when Beverly talked to you about the breaching levees and the Mr. Go, again, all of that area was flooded. The levees were breached by Katrina and the barge that you saw in a number of presentations was refloated and came down and settled on some additional houses. I was in the field within 48 hours of Katrina hitting land. It took me those 48 hours to cut all of my relatives and my family out. 
At that time, I went out in the field, I went in helicopters, I went in cars, I went in boats and did damage assessments and needs assessments and started taking sediment samples that were washed on shore by the tidal surge in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. I'd come back at night and call the nonprofit groups and say, this group and this group and this group need these supplies immediately. And so they would move in the next day and provide the supplies <clears throat> while I went out in the field in another location. Also at night when I come back, the only phones we had were cell phones and it only worked when you got back to New Iberia. I'd call the groups and individuals who had been relocated out of harm's way and give them an assessment of what was going on in their community. So meanwhile, while that part of my life was continuing for the last two and a half plus years, I also was providing technical assistance to community groups, which I'd like to talk to you about. But life over the last two and a half years has just been unbelievably busy, 20 hours a day, seven days a week, but unbelievably productive in being able to help the community. So environmental justice communities are frequently and negatively impacted by living and working in close proximity to and downstream of pollution sources and environmental hazards. And that's sort of been the theme you've been hearing as the day progressed. The environmental justice communities experience numerous severe and widespread health impacts and degradation of their quality of life. And frequently they can't distinguish a health impact from a degradation of their quality of life. They just know that they are sick and they are sick and tired of being sick. And it usually comes from chemical plants and multiple stressors and from a whole host of issues. So when you heard a lot of the presentations today, they could hone in on one particular source or one particular chemical. For these communities, it's multiple layers or cumulative impacts. So the environmental justice communities are more vulnerable. Why are they more vulnerable? Because they are susceptible. They have genetic predisposition to disease. They have pre-existing health conditions. So it's not what you would envision a middle-class white community who could fend off some of these uh, pollution factors. They also have differential exposure. Usually they work at these facilities and the menial jobs. They live close to it and they have multiple exposures from work, from home, from a number of facilities surrounding where they live and work. And then they have differential preparedness and they have a differential ability to recover. That means once they are exposed and impacted, they don't respond and recover as well as middle class, quote, white people living in far away communities. They have com compromised health and immune systems and they have little or no health care. And you heard about that in New Orleans. Well, the lack of health care extended over 600 miles of total destruction from the hurricanes, as well as all these other communities around the United States and in foreign countries that have called and asked for help. So when you provide environmental consulting to community groups, you have to put it in a format that they can understand. But then they become educated and they become empowered and they are then going to take on the issues based on the knowledge that you transfer to them. They figure out what's impacting their health, what's increasing their chemical body burden, and what's impacting their quality of life. And we'll talk a minute later about the body burden issue, which is sort of like one of the emerging issues at the national level. They integrate their knowledge into their specific community situation. And once they've had some wins, they're able to help other communities that have similar situations going on in theirs. They educate government agencies, elected officials, industrial representatives, and the general public. And I'd like to say that again because that is so important. All of those stakeholders will go, well, where did you get that information? How did you find it out? They educate the government agencies, the elected officials, industrial representatives, and the general public. And that is so critical in moving the issues ahead. They educate health care providers to associate their health impacts with issues that go on. Perhaps there's a big emission at an adjacent industrial facility, and they go in and tell the doctor, we had nosebleeds. Well, they see five different doctors. So then we go in and do workshops for the medical community and say, 
these are the chemicals and these are the health impacts associated with those chemicals. And when five people from that community come in with a nosebleed, you need to call up the response agency and say, what chemical got released? Is that what's causing all of these patients to come in through my door and ask for help? They achieved substantial reductions in toxic exposure. Substantial reductions in toxic exposure. They isolate and clean up pollution sources by working with the agencies and the industry. They improve the ambient air and surface water quality in their community and downstream. They relocate communities out of harm's way. But always the relocation has to be voluntary because frequently the elderly just want to live there until they die. They don't want to move as bad as it is, so it has to be a choice situation. And they implement steps to reduce their body burden, which is critical to the long-term health of the community. And they improve the human health and quality of life for all community members, not just the ones that have been involved actively in the fight. We heard a lot today about information, the lack of information. There is a whole host of information that is readily available, but people don't know where to look. You go in at the request of a community and they say, we don't know anything about our community and there's no information. Well, where can you find it? Federal, state, and local environmental health agencies filed. State of Louisiana just put on electronic database five years worth of environmental data from each facility that's either had a permit or been inspected or had enforcement. So I can sit at my office and look at five years worth of data. But more important, the community can sit there and look at the data on their facility that they're concerned about. And every time a new document is entered in, within a day or two, it's up on that electronic system. There are scientific investigations, both at the academic level and from the industry. Again, you take it with a grain of salt. There's a toxic release inventory. There's ambient air monitoring data. There's reports on accidental releases and upset conditions. There are mobile monitoring programs. There's risk management plans. There's permit applications, or permit modifications, and permit compliance responses. All that data is available if you go look for it and then start putting it together about this particular community that's surrounded by industrial facilities or about this industrial facility that the community thinks is having an impact. So here are a few examples. The Rubbertown area of Louisville, Kentucky. Rubbertown was formed in the uh, early 40s as a response to make synthetic rubber when they couldn't get access to the natural rubber from the rubber trees. Louisville residents have said some of the greatest exposed risks to airborne toxic chemicals of any of the communities in the southeast United States. That's quoting the Environmental Protection Agency. The Rubbertown residents were being exposed at least to 18 toxic chemicals in concentrations up to hundreds of times higher than the EPA considered safe. What was the EPA doing? Very little to educate and bring that message to the community. There, was, there are 16 industrial facilities and EJ residents in the Rubbertown area of Louisville. More than 50 toxic chemicals are released into the air in excess quantities. The toxic chemicals were being detected by an air monitoring program. Community members were sick and unaware of the monitoring data and what the monitoring data showed was being filed away in a drawer. And when I asked the agency, well, why are you filing it away in your drawer? They said, because we're waiting for enough money to do a risk assessment and it may take us a few years. So right now we're just filing it in a drawer. The Rubbertown community used the technical information to give a voice and a face to the data that was in the drawer. They identified industrial facilities with my help that was the source of the chemicals that were being released. Once they saw the data, then they said, well, okay, who are these chemicals coming from? They utilized the information to track the pollution burden on the community. They correlated the health impacts with the chemicals and the industrial facilities. And they educated local, state, and federal agencies, health care providers, school board members, and parents, and many others. 
And they demonstrated the need for and push for regulatory programs to improve the air quality in rubber town. The monitoring stations were collecting samples once every 12 days. And again, the data was put in that, that drawer. So when I started taking the data and plotting it in the rubber town area, started looking at the chemicals and looking at the standards, what you see up there is vinyl chloride over the accepted standard. So you see the big circle around all of that area, both the industrial facilities and the residential area, were having air in excess of the standard. The highest one was Cane River Elementary School, three-fourths of a mile from the Bell Lane facilities that were releasing the vinyl chloride. Now, vinyl chloride is a known human cancer-causing agent, causes angiosarcoma of the liver, and the monitor on top of the school was getting the highest hits. So we went in and educated the principal, the school board, and the parents, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency and the local agency. So the Rubber Town community members were really working hard and were most responsible for the efforts that demonstrated the need for what was called the STAR program, Strategic Toxic Air Reductions Program, which required all of those facilities you just saw to do reduction in emissions to meet the ambient air standards. Community members held workshops to educate other community members and other stakeholders on the STAR program. Community members also attended and testified at every single meeting at which the STAR program was discussed. And community members provided updates on the data on a monthly basis. So what I did was get the data on a monthly basis and put it into a short little memo for the community. And they brought that to every single meeting as the STAR program was debated. And why? Because the industry said there's no need for a STAR program anymore. When we found out how bad our emissions were, we reduced them. Well, based on the ongoing monthly data, the levels were increasing in the air. So the community brought that information to these meetings. And these are the comments that came back from EPA. EPA Region 4 said, the collaboration among the Metro Air District, which has delegation for the air program from EPA, the community and the industry over the course of the last several years resulted in a sound technical and community involvement base for the STAR program. EPA started lessons learned, stated lessons learned in Louisville would help other communities address toxic air concerns. And finally, in a memo to me, EPA said, Wilma, I am impressed by the community involvement in Louisville and hope it will continue. Your suggestions and guidance for the rubber town community has enhance their understanding of the air toxic issues. They are still fighting. The program has been implemented. Every legislative session, the industry tries to get it reduced. And they are still there. And they are the recipients of much cleaner air quality in Rubberton. So Mossville is a community in Louisiana near the Texas border. Its community organizations are Mossville Environmental Action Network, mean. It's a historical African-American community founded in the 1790s. They're surrounded by 14 industrial facilities, seven of which release dioxin into the environment. And we're talking industrial facility, community, industrial, residential, all, all mixed together. There's no separation of land use. ATSDR performed dioxin testing of the blood of 22 Mossville residents in both 97, 98 time frame and in 2001. It was high in 97, 98, and they thought if they came back in 2001, it would be all gone, because some of them were relocated. ATSGR determined that the residents of Mossville had an average level of dioxin in the blood, which was three times higher than the general U.S. population. So the raw data contained the dioxin congeners, and I convinced ATSGR to give me the raw data, but not tell me 
who the people were because of confidentiality. But give me the raw data showing me the congeners. And then the docs and congeners are also released by the industry and reported to the toxic release inventory. So I did a comparison of the congener fingerprint from the blood of the Mossville community and from the industrial facilities that were released in docs and into the air. And there were three times more docs and congeners in the residents' blood that contributed 77% of the toxicity. And those same three congeners were the ones that the Georgia Gulf facility was releasing. So Georgia Gulf fingerprint and Mossville blood fingerprint exactly ma matched. So we're working with the agencies, we're working with the community to reduce their exposure and their body burden. We're asking the agencies and Georgia Gulf to reduce their emissions. We're educating the community about the levels of dioxin in the vegetables that were sampled in their yard, in the fruits, in the fish they eat, in the eggs they eat. So we're trying to get them to reduce their body burden by reducing the ongoing exposure of the foods they put in their mouth and what Georgia Gulf releases into the air that impacts the community. Dioxin sampling is very expensive, so it will be a number of years before ATSDR comes back. Okay, so dioxin releases. There's a, um, a little poster up there on Turkey Creek. That's one of the facilities I'm working with the community. Turkey Creek has a long history, African-American community. It's got two sources of dioxin. One is the old creosote facility, and until I started reviewing data, the agency hadn't looked for dioxin in any of the waste in the creosote facility, and in fact it closed a number of units by impounding and covering and doing groundwater recovery. And then there's a CB base that had taken all the dioxin from Vietnam, the Agent Orange, and every time we had a hurricane, the 55-gallon drums would get washed into the water bodies. So the CB base drains into Turkey Creek. So we're looking at two different fingerprints, but until I started getting involved with them, even the agencies weren't looking of how do we distinguish whether it's from the CB base or from the creosote facility. Now they're starting to look at that. We're doing remediation near the CB base, and we're looking at doing remediation at the creosote plant. But it's a, a very slow, methodical process. But there are other sources of dioxin. The wood treating plant like Turkey Creek over there, titanium dioxide manufacturing facilities, vinyl chloride manufacturing facilities, coal-fired power plants, industrial facilities such as petroleum refineries and petrochemical plants, paper mills, and Agent Orange storage facilities or processing facilities. So if any of these are in the area where you're working, you need to require the agency, because it's very expensive, to do the dioxin congener analysis, and then you can start comparing that to soil samples, to community blood, to the air releases, and you can make a huge difference, but this is just sort of a real sleeper issue right now, and no one wants to bring those issues up. As a result of the hurricane sampling, I told you sediment sludge, I sampled near a titanium dioxide facility in what's called DeLille, which is near Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. So I took samples and found that the material that washed off of the titanium dioxide facility had a lot of dioxin in it over the standards. Then I brought the data to the community first and then EPA, and they went and did additional sampling around because they have more money than we have. And they found a similar pattern in the dioxin conjuring. We asked Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry to do an evaluation of the data, and they got data from on-site the fertility, which showed that they had the same fingerprint in their waste on-site as I found off-site and EPA found off-site in the drainage, and ATSCR said, well, we really need to now look in the base system at the crab population, because everyone crabs in St. Louis Bay. And again, this area was totally obliterated during Hurricane Katrina and totally obliterated again what was left in Hurricane Rita. So when ATSDR did sampling around the bay, they did the sediment and they did the crab, and the Blue Point crab in Louisiana, when you open them up, they have what's called, the citizens call mustard. It's, it's a hepatic membrane, and they found the highest levels in that. They found the levels in the crab, and they found it in the sediment all the way around the bay. 
So even though the facility is located basically in the upper right-hand corner, they found everything contaminated. As a result of that, they issued advisories for young women and uh, teenagers that were going to be pregnant in the next few years not to eat any of it because it transfers to the fetus and has such a huge impact. We're having a lot of problems getting that message out. ATSCR hasn't wanted to post anything. When we put up signs, they get torn down. We've been doing workshops and all to educate. This is a community of Calavas in Manatee County in Florida. And the community group is called FOCUS, Family Oriented Community United Strong. It's an African American community of 250 people that was founded in the 1890s for the turpentine workers and their families. And then there's a, a company called Laurel American Beryllium Company. It operated from 61 to 96, and it made beryllium parts for the manufacturing of nuclear reactors and weapons. Community members both worked at the beryllium facility and lived right there next to the facility. An underground leak from the beryllium facility contaminated groundwater. It was detected in 2000. The people in Talavas drink from individual water wells. They weren't told to 2004 and 2005 that their water wells were contaminated. Both the company knew and the state agency knew, but didn't tell the community. And when they started off, the area where they said the contaminated plume was, was five acres and then 50 acres. So I started evaluating the data for them and saying, this is where the plume is not defined. I'd write letters to the agency and say, you have the authority to require the company, which had big bucks, deep pockets, to continue determining the extent of the plume, both like this and how deep it is. And the agency kept writing back and telling me, no, we don't have that authority. Well, I'd worked with the state agency a long time. I knew what their authority was, and we just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. It started off as five acres. It's now over 200 acres, and they still don't have the total extent defined. But I keep pushing and telling them they have the authority, and the company submitted a remedial action plan, which was sort of do nothing and watch it. And then finally, the state agency decided to take action and wrote a letter and said all the things I had been telling them they had the jurisdiction for, they're requiring the company to go in and completely define it and then develop a new remedial action plan that has activities associated, not with just watch it migrate. So now it's over 200 acres, but it's not adequately addressed to consist of they don't want to look at the air and the soil contamination. They don't want to look at historical exposure. The workers worked on site, brought the dust home, all over their clothing. The kids hugged them. The wives washed the clothes. The air emissions from this facility put the dust into the attic of these homes where it's still located in high levels, very highly contaminated. It exposed the households besides the workers. The health agency has stated that the community has an elevated risk of developing kidney, cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, and liver cancer. The community wants to be locate, relocated but they don't, because this is their community. It's a historical community. They don't want to have to live there with all of this mess, but they don't want to have to move as well. So you frequently get into that conflict, and all of this has to be a community decision on how you move forward. And then Midway Village in Daly City, Daly City, California, is an EJ community that consists of Hispanic and African American members living in the San Mateo County housing complex. They are renters. They are hub subsidized renters. Midway Village housing complex was constructed on top of waste from a manufactured gas plant that was operated from 1906 to 1999. This is a clear sin of the past. Contaminants are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the soil. Sediment soil remediation activities took place in 90, 91, 94, and 2001. And then they asked me to look at the data in 2006. And when I looked at the data, I found out that only 10% of the site had been remediated. All of those activities I just showed you, they had told the people, the whole site is now clean, you can live in this apartment complex, and you're perfectly safe. 
Well, only 10%. It wasn't cleaned up under the houses, under the streets, under the sidewalks, under the playground. And where they did clean up, they only cleaned up a short distance. So under that, maybe two feet in different places, four feet, there was still all the contaminated soil. So the plants grow and bring up all the contaminated soil into the houses. The plants grow along the inside wall of the house, into the house, and bring all the contaminated soil up. And the community has extensive health problems, and it wants to be relocated. But it's also scared that if they get moved into other HUD subsidized housing, it's going to be more dangerous living for them. So they're really caught. Technical assistance and scientific information is critically important to both educate and empower community members and enable the community members to participate in environmental and public health issues. Thank you. This is obviously the stalwart group here. It's good, it's good to see everyone here. I, I, I'm glad to see everyone's awake. And may, I hope I will continue to be awake for, for the next half an hour or so. Um, let me see how I'm going to do this. I, I want to thank the organizers um, for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here. I, I was at Rutgers University for a year, uh, the poor second cousin down the road. So I, I, I came to Princeton a lot. So it's wonderful to be back. And um, I, I also have to say, um, I'm also very honored to be on the same panel with Wilma Subra. Um, I think her career has has really embodied the uh, idea that science at its best should be practiced in, in the service of social justice and environmental responsibility. I, and I think that uh, Wilma Suber's work really has, um, has been in the spirit of doing a, a science for the people. Well, one of my goals as a teacher is to encourage my environmental science students to, to explore alternative paths in science. And uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, those less da dazzling paths, those less um, masters of the universe paths of science um, that may be in, in, in favor of a more embedded form of environmental science, uh, one that's more mundane in the sense of more in and of the world, more earth-based, connected to social justice aims. So many of my students actually do long for a more meaningful path uh, if they choose environmental science as their, as their major. And I often point to them in the direction of Wilma Subra's work. So thank you, Wilma, for doing the work that you do. And, I, and as I talked to you earlier, I'm going to talk to you to, to at, see if you can help with our work here in Holyoke, Massachusetts as well. So today I'm going to talk about a project that I've been involved with for many years, and it's it's a project that I also hope hopes hope and intends uh, uh, it, it that hope is creating a new science for the people itself, and um, moves us towards a new new and I would say more relational uh, models of scientific practice and towards what uh, the uh, uh, anthropologist Arturo Escobar has called a new order of knowledge. And what I have called a new order of knowledge, what is something that I have called uncommon expertise, or what some people have termed situated science or even street science. And, and I think that this new order of knowledge is produced by forging uh, new epistemic or knowledge producing assemblages and environmental alliances across different knowledge systems, across different Practices, uh, practices of science, and across different politics, environmental politics. 
And it's here that I kind of want to wave the banner in support of um, the um, emerging multi-issue expansiveness of, of the uh, environmental justice movement. Um, I think that while, uh, you know, while the critique of the diffusion of the environmental justice movement, I can, I can understand that, and diffusion by definition is bad uh, because of the unfocus, the unconcentration, but I also think that um, one of the strengths of the movement is in fact its polyvocal character, its multiplicitousness, um, its ability for people to identify different nodes or points of entry so they can see themselves as part of the movement. And I think that we see evidence globally as well as nationally or domestically in the United States of this kind of perhaps decentralized or multiplicitous movement that in fact is being quite successful, that there's actually a, a text out, uh, that, uh, out of, on the, uh, um, the shelves where you can look at, at, at some of the EJ books that are uh, that have been recently published. One of them is by um, David Pello. It's called Resisting Global Toxics. And he documents a whole list of what he calls transnational so social movement organizations, environmental justice organizations working at the transnational or global level that are actually um, uh, bringing, uh, bringing about a lot of change internationally. Um, Again, as Arturo Escobar has, has, uh, has written, these emerging sciences of, of environmental justice are a part of what, of what he calls a new knowledge churn in social movement research and practice. And this knowledge churn is, um, I think, developing sciences that are, uh, as he puts it, quote, relational rather than individual, complex instead of binary, interdependent instead of sufficient unto themselves, embedded and embodied as opposed to disembedded and disembodied. And I think that the environmental justice movement in the US and political ecology movements in other parts of the world represent such a, a so-called knowledge turn in the ways that social movements encounter and, and uh, interact with and transform the sciences. I think that environmental justice, and this is, I think, Wilma Subra's presentation showed this, I think environmental justice activists have broadened the sphere of what counts as environmental knowledge and expertise, and have recognized and valued both experiential and experimental knowledge. They've asked questions about how environmental knowledge is generated and by whom, and how knowledge is being used to bring about social and environmental change, and of course, how knowledge is shared, made, made public, and disseminated. They've also insisted that environmental knowledge is multi-sided. They've made demands that their uh, complex and critical knowledge of place, of ecology, of health, of technology, pollution, um, and environmental change and sustainability be paid attention to and become part of local environmental decisions and policies. So in, in my talk today, I'm going to talk about or discuss an example of what I'm calling situated science, or situated science, and in other words, I'm going to talk about a story of the production of um, embodied ecologies in an urban, deindustrialized, economically depressed environmental justice community in western Massachusetts in the lower reaches of the Connecticut River watershed uh, where I live and work. Because I want to focus on the the uh, specifics of the work, I don't want to talk uh, too much more in the abstract, but I do want to just very briefly introduce a framework for this environmental justice story that, that analyzes it, on the one hand, as embodying new ecological relationships, what I think is a new urban ecology that articulates or that joins together social, cultural, and environmental ideas and practices. But it also is a story, I think, that describes the shaping of innovative environmental politics in a small place in Western Massachusetts in the context of a broader, of the broader political, economic, and e ecological dynamics of neoliberalism, which of course is the current mode of globalized capitalism dedicated to increasing the 
the privatization of all spheres of life and, and decreasing government regulations and oversight of the activities of industrial capital. So my interest in raising questions about how the critical embodied ecologies of the environmental justice movement with their insistence on creating a new order of environmental knowledge in which the worldly materialities of everyday life, in other words, clean air, clean water, uh, clean land, decent food, healthy and safe neighborhoods, healthy and safe schools and workplaces, um, that these materialities, these worldly materialities of everyday life become the center of the scientific research enterprise. And I'm interested in how these social and ecological knowledge-based interventions of the environmental justice movement both create challenges to and are constrained by the, the um, political economy of neoliberalism. So many, many critics have noted that neoliberalism or the neoliberal project has, has since sometimes, sometime in the 1990s, become kinder and gentler. Um, and many uh, national governments have appeared to embrace, with gusto, ideas that were generally thought to be the domain of progressive, even radical movements. Ideas, for example, like civic participation, participatory democracy, environmental justice, and sustainability. And these progressive ideas, which in large part are centered on the idea of participation, were supposed to challenge and even colonize the neoliberal state, making it more accountable and, and more responsive to civil society, to the needs of those communities whose lives and environments were being devastated by the ravages of neoliberalization around the world. But instead, these critics argue, the mainstreaming of concepts such as participation, civic engagement, sustainability, and even environmental justice has in some cases worked to depoliticize the public sphere through the institutionalization of approved and appropriate channels of participation. For example, uh, community advisory boards or government community policy councils or community-based environmental monitoring, community-based risk assessment, um, healthy community initiatives, et cetera. Although uh, these initiatives are instituted in the name of participation or environmental justice, these, these approved channels of engagement sometimes work, and that this is what critics say, not to expand, but to narrow the opportunities for civic participation for many sectors of civil society. And through the new techniques of collaboration and co-governance, function instead to ensure stability and non-contentious civil society government relations, effectively containing contentious politics, public protests, and what some call uncivil challenges to the government. And so, again, as these critics contend, neoliberalism gains ground, merrily expands its reach into even more arenas of everyday life, now with the consent and stamp of approval of an, of an actively participatory civil society. As many people here in the, in the room who study political change and social movements are very familiar, much of the, this critical analysis arises from third world scholars and activists and many from Latin American contexts and focus on, and they focus on a critique of how international development agencies and institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, and government officials in countries of the global south have embraced and even mandated the imposition of participatory mechanisms to engage the civil society sector the goals of fostering good governance, furthering democracy, promoting sustainable development, alleviating poverty, environmental dis destruction, and all the other ills produced by market-driven models of economic development. And many of these critical scholars and activists take the position that civic participation in all its guises, whether enacted through techniques of collaboration, deliberation, consultation, have become neoliberal, and paradoxically, it has functioned to suppress social protest and collective action. And as such, again, critics argue, has become synonymous with co-optation, or what some critics have called governmentality from below. And now then uh, other um, analysts of political transformation and social movements, including of the environmental justice movement, argue instead that the adoption by organized power, such as governments or the World Bank, 
the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the adoption of ideas of participation, sustainability, environmental justice, have, uh, has produced complex and not easily containable social and environmental coalitions and alliances, although which community through which community activists forge new modes of participatory engagement, engagement that creatively and critically combine practices across civil and uncivil boundaries and across government, private, and civil society sectors. So for, for these analysts, participation has not been fully contained by neoliberalism and civil society in the name of participation in social and environmental justice often engages in uncivilized contention. So by my, I, what I want to, to talk about today is an example in this small place in Western Massachusetts where I live of a um, civil society or community-based um, government and private sector collaboration or alliance that um, we've, we've crafted. Um, and, I'm, and I'm still, I'm, 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 I'm trying to imagine the extent to which this, this, um, this collaboration actually uh, is contained by um, sort of the, the, neo, the neoliberal focus to get people to um, engage in a, what some people call a, um, a, a entrepreneurial citizenry where you um, police your own community, you monitor your own air and water, you uh, be responsible to take your, your own asthma medication, you, you're a responsible parent by uh, making sure that your children are um, not exposed to cockroach feces that, that may trigger their asthma. Um, this kind of individual, um, quote, neoliberal approach to environmental policy and environmental management. And um, I'm, what, I'm, what I want to do is in, in this uh, engagement that we have now, that the community I work with has now with the EPA, the extent to which this is falling into that or whether there are examples of uh, participation that in fact is challenging the neoliberal tendencies in this new form of, uh, of governance, um, that, that this kinder and gentler form of neoliberalism that really, in terms of environmental justice, we see, we see initiated with, during the Clinton administration. Okay, so um, I want to then uh, uh, introduce the the case study, which is working together with, with my students and I actually working together um, with a community organization called Nuestras Raices, which in Spanish means our roots. Um, Nuestras Raices is a uh, community organization in, located in the city of Holyoke. And just some basic context in terms of Holyoke. Holyoke is considered one of the first planned industrial cities in the United States. It was um, established in the mid-19th century um, along the Connecticut River, making use of, the, uh, of, of a dam that was built by one of the trustees of Mount Holyoke College all, uh, on the Connecticut River. And um, the dam offered or supported water power for the uh, textile and paper mills in Holyoke. Um, Holyoke, the mills were the labor force for the mills was, were immigrant labor from uh, Ireland, from Germany, from Poland, and from French Canada. Uh, they lived in uh, large tenements, and uh, essentially Holyoke was called Paper City because it created some, some of the high quality paper, the most high quality paper in the United States. Um, in the late 1800s and early 20th century, the mill started closing and moving down south. The uh, tenements were actually, um, uh, uh, the, or, or rather, the, uh, the mills closed, the, the laborers uh, were, were put out of work, and then the tenements become available. In the 1950s and 60s, the uh, newest migrants started coming to Holyoke. These were migrants from Puerto Rico. Um, they came to work in the uh, tobacco fields in western Massachusetts, and the most affordable housing they could find were the abandoned tenements in Holyoke. 
So Holyoke to, today is a community that is uh, 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 a community that is 41% Puerto Rican. Um, most of the Puerto Ricans live in the abandoned tenements, or well, they're now refurbished tenements, and um, it's one of the poorest communities in uh, in Western Mass in Massachusetts. So the the organization Huesas Raíces um, occupies the corner space of, of a refurbished commercial building, including a beautiful brick patio modeled after a Puerto Rican community plaza. The building is located in the downtown district of Holyoke, and it's um, again it's a city of about 40,000, 41 percent. Uh, are, are Puerto Rican Latino. Nuestras Raíces was originally promoted to, was founded to promote community development in the predominantly low-income Puerto Rican Latino neighborhoods by transforming abandoned lots, abandoned city lots into urban gardens and farmers markets. And it has evolved into a broadly based environmental justice organization, again a multi-issue environmental justice organization, um, linking social and economic development, ecological sustainability, environmental health, gender and racial and ethnic justice, and cultural diversity. Typical of the demographic pattern uh, documented by environmental justice scholars, the majority of Holyoke's poor and low-income Latino residents live in neighborhoods situated in the industrial uh, sector of the city and are disproportionately at risk for increased rates of environmental illnesses such as cancer, asthma, heart disease and, and various autoimmune conditions due to exposure to industrial toxins and other stressors associated with living in poor and contaminated environments. Although most companies that comprise the once thriving paper and textile mill industry are no longer in operation, some remaining factories, uh, including plastics, paint, tool and dye, are still emitting environmental contaminants into the air and water and soil and bodies of South Holyoke communities. Moreover, most South Holyoke uh, families live amongst the now abandoned and boarded up and often contaminated factory buildings designated by the Environmental Protection Agency as, as brownfields, and we've uh, heard about uh, brownfields today. And they also, the communities also find themselves contending with um, illegal garbage dumping, looting, drug trafficking, all of the kinds of issues that frequently accompany uh, the social and economic disinvestments in urban centers. Um, that, that result from that, that are resulting from industrial flight and or suburban sprawl. Living in the shadow of the Mount Tom power plant, one of the uh, state of Massachusetts so-called filthy five coal-fired electricity generators, um, which is exempted from the Federal Clean Air Act's air quality standards due to its age. Nuestros Raíces organizers speak of the extraordinarily high levels of asthma and other respiratory illnesses st suffered in the community. In addition to the Mount Tom facility um, scattered throughout the downtown Holyoke neighborhoods are other manufacturing plants that belch noxious fumes into the air and deposit layers of grimy particulate matter onto the sidewalks, the windows, and the soil, which is a, which is a particular concern to the community gardeners. One of the lead organizers, Hilda Colon, tells me and my students, um, we think there's a connection between our kids' asthma and these factories. And she points to one of these community-generated maps, a GIS map, indicating the clustering of the city's toxic uh, re release sites in downtown Holyoke. Um, and she says uh, that she feels that she believes there's a connection between these sites and her kids' asthma. Uh, but the health department and the EPA say it's not conclusive, and that this is, these are her words. Other activists talk about the high rates of breast cancer, diabetes, and heart problems suffered by their families, friends, and neighbors. Now, although the organizers, and th this is now in the context of the organizers at Nuestras Raíces working with my students and myself in a course that, in a community-based learning course I teach called Urban Ecology. The, the organizers tell us, uh, as we work together with the group, many stories of the environmental injustices facing their community, but they also talk with pride about transforming the blighted urban landscape of downtown Holyoke into what many 
the activists call a geography of hope, a bountiful network of thriving community gardens yielding healthy, organic produce. And um, one of the leaders of the urban gardeners gives, gives my students a tour of the, uh, of the, what's called the Centro Agricola, which is the center, central plaza in, in the, uh, in, at Nuestras Raices. Uh, and the, and there, there's a greenhouse there which houses the neatly arranged trays of vegetable starts for the spring, plant, uh, spring planting. And he also draws students here. Here's the, uh, here's the greenhouse here. He also draws students' attention to the um, aromatic hothouse chilies, the cilantros, the, um, the chilies that are native to Puerto Rico, and various herbs that, that are used by the cooks at Mi Plaza restaurant here, which is one of the um, small-scale community enterprises that Nuestras Raices has helped to create. Amongst the, the other micro-enterprises include um, the El Jardin Artisan Bakery. The, there's a community kitchen also here in this plaza, in Nuestras Raices Plaza. Sofrito El Cielo, um, which sofrito is a Puerto Rican salsa that is um, used in, in fish dishes and meat dishes by um, Puerto Rican cooks, um, also at the restaurant. Um, the um, Puerto Rican specialty chilies and herbs are also uh, dried and cured in, in oil and sold at local farmers markets. The teenage group, the teenage members of Nuestras Raices, uh, discuss their, again with my students, discuss their environmental education campaigns which focus on recycling, soil erosion, ecological restoration, and they also talk about their, the new project um, that the organization has started called the Tierra de Oportunidades, which means land of opportunity, um, which is a 30-acre tract of urban agricultural and forested land along the Connecticut River that has provided uh, expanded commercial farm opportunities and plots for local gardeners. It also houses a community center to support cultural events and offers uh, environmental education programs emphasizing sustainable agriculture and urban riparian ecology. Here we have um, some of the youth garden team selling uh, produce. This is in the inner city farmers markets. This is in the farm stand, which is out on the Tierra de Oportunidades land, the 30-acre farm lot, farm plot. This is a group of, of the youth environmental team and the youth garden team out on the farm plot. The community center that houses um, stage and there are other uh, buildings that you can't see here but Puerto Rican festivals, um, cultural events, music, food, um, all kinds of activities happen on this land um, that has now become sort of a center of Latino Holyoke. <clears throat> from, from these conversations about the political ecology of downtown Holyoke that are exuberantly described by by the members of Nuestras Raices, it becomes clear to my environmental studies students that these concepts that we've been reading about in our courses, social nature um, and urban ecology, are much more than, oh, I need to keep going, okay, um, oh, sorry, two minutes? Oh, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm going to do the, the, the next half of my presentation then in two minutes, uh, which is fine, which is fine. Um, the, oops. How do I get rid of this? Okay. The, this is the uh, the um, los protectores de la tierra, which is the environment, the nuestras races, the environmental youth team. Um, here we are. Uh, the two, two of the members of the youth team. Uh, mapping soil profiles. That this is out on the farm. Uh, one of the things that the environmental team has also done is to work together with my students and myself uh, to gather together some local uh, uh, information about health statistics and TRI, um, the, the major TRI um, emissions in Holyoke. 
The youth team has also developed what, what we call a soot patrol, looking at um, the numbers of diesel vehicles in, uh, in the urban and residential areas. The soot patrols actually look at diesel vehicles that are crossing through common residential areas, uh, numbers of vehicles per hour, and mapping them. The women's organization or the women's leadership group has also uh, started looking at not outdoor air pollution, but indoor air pollution and looking at uh, healthy homes in initiatives, working with Massachusetts environmental organizations to look at um, a, uh, an, uh, uh, a toxic bill that, that's going through the Massachusetts State House now that, that would uh, require uh, healthy, uh, healthy alternatives to common cleaning products and, and personal care products. Um, to bring together all of this information, we decided collectively to apply for one of these um, uh, collect, uh, cooperative agreement EPA uh, grants. It's called the CARE program, Community Action for a Renewed Environment. Again, it's community-based environmental monitoring and environmental research. It's intended to be a cooperative agreement with the EPA, with community groups, and with local government and local uh, private uh, companies. Uh, we have started to um, build the Pioneer, what we're, we're calling the Pioneer Valley Community Environmental Justice Coalition. Again, this cross-sector group, multi-stakeholder group, and we've started to actually, with our different academic partners, environmental partners, government partners, community partners, look at some of the health and um, pollution source data and map them. And this is, again, all in collaboration with the activists in Nuestras Raices. My students and local youth organizers are also looking at um, bringing together information about community-based air monitoring and uh, asthma information, putting them together in bilingual um, brochures. Uh, World Asthma Day teach-ins that are looking at some of the problems, but also some of the alternatives, such as, for example, solar and wind power and, and alternative cleaning products. Uh, doing um, workshops on lean and green manufacturing for some of the local industries that are still using toxic products and, and, uh, and various kinds of solvents. Um, all of this information was very important. Um, and this sort of discussion about exposure and toxins and alternatives was very important when only a few months ago a, uh, a Massachusetts-based waste trader rode into town in his huge black Mercedes with the vanity license plate debris um, and proposed this uh, um, solid waste transfer station to be located right on Main Street, USA, in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Um, Again, challenging the, the notion that, that some of these multi-stakeholder coalitions um, depoliticize the, the, the public sphere. Um, this, the group uh, developed a, an, organ, an ad hoc organization called Holyoke Organized to Protect the Environment and actually engaged in some more uh, uh, uncivil uh, activities, protests here at the uh, city council. Um, people actually were articulating important issues about environmental justice in front of the city council using the, the language of environmental justice, toxic emissions, cumulative risk, and sustainability. Um, the EPA and NESCALM, a local um, government and private air quality a agency in Massachusetts, jumped into uh, action uh, when this waste trader came to town and we um, installed a um, ethylometer, which is a black carbon monitor, in the house of one of um, our partners, William Aponte, who only lives a half a mile from the proposed site. Um, we, we don't yet have the analysis from, from this. It's very new. But you can see those black circles there are um, some of the uh, um, evidence of black carbon in this area. We also are working together with AirMap. Uh, atmospheric, clim uh, atmospheric chemists from, um, from the University of New Hampshire to start measuring volatile organic compounds. And here I have a student who is working with the University of New Hampshire to do some community uh, training on using these volatile organic compound uh, air canisters. And community members also take pictures of the various plastics and solvents 
and adhesives um, and paper companies that apparently emit more uh, in, at night when, when nobody's around. These are some of the sites that uh, the community members and my students are testing for volatile organic compounds. Uh, this is the proton transfer reaction mass spectrometer, which is at University of, of New Hampshire. Um, a recent public rally against the, the waste transfer station, getting people to sign on. Again, contentious politics. And just last week, um, at um, the, this is my, my second to the last slide. Uh, just last week um, at the at the Massachusetts State House. Nalani and Milagros, two youth met members, um, actually had gathered together information to um, present and testify um, at, at, at the State House on an important diesel bill that's being brought. And I just want to end with, with this slide, um, which really is one of my favorite slides, uh, or rather one of my favorite uh, quotes uh, in one of the, one of the uh, community gardens in one of the urban gardens in, in Holyoke. And I, I just, uh, I told Milagros Guzman that this was one of my favorite quotes in Holyoke. And um, I was sharing some readings that I give to my students uh, with, with some of the teenagers. And she read what, one of the articles. And I just want to quote uh, or take or, a, a quote that she said was one of her favorite quotes in one of the readings that my students in the urban ecology read. And the quote comes from an article by Donna Haraway. And this is how it goes. There will be no nature without justice. Nature and justice, contested discursive objects embodied in the material world, will become extinct or survive, survive together. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to open it up to questions for the panelists. Question. Yes. Uh, my question is for uh, Wilma. I notice you've been doing this for 25 or 30 years, and I'm very, very impressed with your work. Uh, and could you give us a summary of what's happened to your funding over the last several decades, maybe by 10-year increments, and in particular, what your funding profile looks like for the next 10 years? Yes. Most of what I do is on a volunteer basis. Um, I'm a for-profit corporation. I get some funding from Louisiana Environmental Action Network, which provides, uh, it's an umbrella group of all the environmental groups, grassroots groups in the state of Louisiana. Most of the foundations and I know we have some people here, uh, fund, fund projects as opposed to fund technical assistance to community groups. Um, Commonweal out of California has provided resources over a number of years to provide technical assistance. I frequently ask for um, a pot of gold where I could have a few dollars that when a community came forth and needed something, like needed copies or needed to, to purchase something, an air sample, that I could use that money to help out those communities. But most of what, what work you've seen me present here today has been on a voluntary basis. I have small business clients that keep enough money flowing in the door to keep the business open. But where I see it in the next 10 years is Again, more funding of specific projects as opposed to funding that you can use as the situation develops, as the communities come forward and need assistance. So money is always a challenge. I have a quick comment for both of you. Just thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. And um, at Holyoke, it sounds like you're mobilizing all the academic resources that you can to really support the community in which you're embedded, and I think that's really admirable and what is really 
missing in some places from the um, gown versus town uh, challenges. So thank you so much, both of you, for all the incredible work of building these connections and so much of this invisible work that makes these connections real and makes this work happen without all the glory um, sometimes that we would like to have for you. Thanks. Well, um, I'd just like to know what your thoughts are on possibly the next steps. Um, from a conference that we've had today, this is one of the first I've attended where there's been such an academic uh, focus on environmental justice. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what the next step might be for Princeton and or the academic community to try to move this dialogue forward. Well. Um I think, is this on or do I, do I need, need it? Oh, okay. Um, I, I think that the model of, um, that we're trying to build in Holyoke where there are partnerships built between the academic environment and local uh, communities, uh, local at-risk communities, local environmental justice communities uh, is very important. It also brings students brings academic partners, it brings local environmental organizations together in, a, in an alliance, in a coalition that starts to think about, I mean, that, that notion that I introduced at the beginning of the new order of knowledge. I mean, you, you, acad academia is considered the uh, sort of dominant uh, site of knowledge production and dissemination, and I think that the environmental justice movement um, and environmental justice activists have, have raised questions about the, the fluidity of that border and where, do, where is knowledge really about the environment, about, about what the problems are, but about what the solutions are too. Where, where does that come from and how should we articulate these different, um, these different approaches to, to knowing and understanding and researching what the problems are. I, I think that our coalition and our partnership is showing some, showing some, um, some promise, and and so I do think that here at Princeton, where where, where we learned earlier, uh, you're you're starting to, to build more community partners around some of these questions. I think that that's a great first step. Um, the five colleges area where I teach, Mount Holyoke College is one of them. Is really trying to work in collaboration with the uh, so-called environmental justice corridor in southern, in the southern Pioneer Valley, in the southern uh, Connecticut River watershed, Springfield and Holyoke. And I think that, that those initiatives are showing some, some promise um, in, in terms of empowering communities using knowledge and sharing knowledge to do that. The first thing I want to do is assure everybody that I'm not going to speak for 30 minutes. I'm only going to offer a few words of thanks and a couple of observations. You know, a couple of us in the room are old enough to remember when environmentalism really took off um, uh, decades ago and to have gone through the period in which the death of environmentalism was being loudly proclaimed. And a couple of things happened. Um, uh, one, of one, one of which we've been learning about today. The first thing that happened was that um, the unintended consequences of our activity continued to move forward inexorably. And in particular, our understanding grew that the climate was warming and that ultimately this was something that we had to contain. And this developed a gigantic sort of top-down 
scientific and social enterprise that was concerned about everyone in general and no one in particular. And we at Princeton have in the best lofty elitist traditions been firmly embedded in that. But what I didn't know and, and what gives me enormous hope, now I should say also, that, that problem, the people who work most heavily on that problem, I think oftentimes feel like we're just marching to our doom, you know, we're trying so hard, it's so difficult, and it's this, in, you know, this inexorable march and toil. But, but this story, the other, the, other, the other development, is really very much more hopeful. Uh, humanity never ceases to amaze me. Somehow, in, in, among the most dispossessed people, the people with the fewest resources worldwide, this movement started to grow and coalesce, coalesce spontaneously, without any top-down organization by elite institutions or anything else. And, and as it developed and coalesced, it developed its own set of academic disciplines, its own sort of standards and concepts, its own successful methods. And, and what I've learned over the past year, and, and today in, in particular, is just how much it's grown. And it seems to me inevitable now, with the growing interest among students and society and environmental movements, that everyone is going to be touched by the, by the development that somehow happened without anyone directing it. So I want to thank all of the speakers for coming here today and educating us in the Princeton community and me. Um, we know that this wasn't, wasn't easy for you. We know how busy everyone is, and we are really grateful for you coming. I also want to thank a few individuals. Um, uh, the, the first is, is Kimberly Smith, who uh, is, has been an academic visitor uh, here because of a, uh, of a, of a generous gift by uh, author and, and entrepreneur Tom Barron. Um, she is exactly the sort of academic visitor that one hopes for. Uh, curious, social, uh, stubborn, pugnacious, brilliant, um, fun to talk to. Uh, and and uh, I, I, we all are, are grateful that she came, and we're all going to mourn her departure back to, to Carleton College when she, when she leaves us. Um, I want to thank Kathy Hackett and the staff at PEI for putting this event together. Uh, they do everything well. Uh, uh, all I do is flit around the world and, and, uh, and, and, and talk to people, and, and uh, they put this together. This is their event, um, and I think we should give them a hand. The whole staff, yeah. And the final person I want to thank is, is uh, uh, Bert Kerstetter, whose, whose heart is as big as his generosity. Um, Bert gave the, the, uh, the gift that, um, that uh, holds these conferences, and as always, Bert, it is a pleasure to have you around. So thanks, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you again.